to stay up here. Huh? <laughs> you might as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've passed that age. <laughs> If you're a daddy here this morning, raise your hand. Now keep that hand up. This is a challenge. Keep that hand up until one of these kids is making a round to you with something. probably know by now what I like to do on Mother's Day and Father's Day. I, I try to give everybody the opportunity to stand up and say something about your father. And if you'd like to stand up and share about your father, about the influence, whatever it might be this morning, I, I'd like to give you that opportunity this morning. We might run a little long, but that's all right. We ain't got no evening service, so you'll be good. Uh, so, Who would like to stand up and say something about their daddy this morning? Go ahead, Tammy. My dad is the most bullheadedest person in the world. Amen. Uh, I love him, and he's my dad. Amen. <laughs> Go ahead, Lulu. Do what, Lulu? He's taking care of you. Yes, he is. Go ahead. He's fun to play with. All right. You love him? He does. Anybody else? Yeah, my daddy's always, he's been bullheaded too, but he's always loved me and taken care of me. Yeah, I can say ditto that for my daddy, too. Anybody else? Uh, I know my children. You got two minutes, DJ. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I know my children bought this for my father's day. And it's really inspiring.
good children for our Heavenly Father. Uh, my quote, uh, a couple of, like to say, I got two minutes, so. <laughs> and yea, Father, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's found in the feast. politics and war that my son may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My son ought to study mathematics and <coughs> philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commercial and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architectures, history, and porcelain. That was John Adams. But uh, anyway, we need to think about our Heavenly Father on Amen. this day. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of might, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the angels, flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add. He knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it down. Anybody else want to share something about your daddy? Go ahead. My daddy was my mother. Because my real dad was a piece of crap and took off when I was four. So by following my mother's example on how to be a good dad, my son needs nothing. He wants nothing. He wants for nothing. And he'll never need for anything. A lot of lows out there. A lot of lows out there. And I'm going to preach on that in a little bit. But the man ain't stepped up to the plate like they're supposed to. Anybody else want to share about their dads? Before I go, go to sharing about mine. You know, I, I kind of like you, Nathan. I, I, the difference was I had a stepdad that stepped in. Uh, I had a stepdad that stepped in. <clears throat> and my mother actually wanted to have children by him. He said, no, I got two boys. I don't need them. And uh, he had a lot of respect for my grandparents on my real dad, my grandma and grandpa Taylor, enough so that that's the only reason he would not adopt us. He didn't want to change our name. But to this day, you ask him about his two boys. I mean, it just it's we're his boys. And you ask one of us who our daddy is. You know, I get asked that sometimes. They'll say, who's your daddy? When I say Brian Dinkins, you can see their eyes, you know, trying to, you can see their minds running, trying to, figure things out. Well, your last name's Taylor. Well, you know, when you ask me that, so that's who I think, because that's the man that raised me. That's the man that was there. That's the man that set the example for me. Uh, we bought him a plaque one time when we were little, and it's always stuck with me. Had a picture of me and my brother, <clears throat> and it said in there, anybody can be a father, but it takes somebody special to be a daddy. And that was, that's my daddy. Uh, anybody else? Connie, it's up to you if you want to take the kids. If not, I'm not going to preach real long this morning. Uh, if you want to stay in here, they can. Oh, you know what they want to do. They don't want to hear me run my mouth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, while y'all figure it out, I'm going to get started. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 128 this morning. Psalm 128. I want you to do your spiritual breathing this morning. Any junk you might have brought in here with you, let, let's, let's breathe in. Let's breathe in. or uh, I'm sorry, let's breathe out and let go of any of that junk you might have brought with you this morning. As you breathe back in, you ask God to replace that with His perfect Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to forewarn you this morning. I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of warning. If you come here this morning... You might have come here as a father thinking, oh, the preacher's going to give us some sweet message.
make us feel real good this morning. Blah, blah, blah. That ain't happening. Let me just go ahead and tell you, that ain't happening. I ain't pulling no punches. I ain't sugarcoating. Nathan said something yesterday about, and it was kind of mean what he said because he was talking about a, a heavy friend of his. He said, I can't sugarcoat it with him. Daddy, he might eat it. You know, and I got to thinking about, and it was kind of mean to say, but I got to thinking about Christians. I got to thinking about us fat, happy Christians, yeah? You can't sugarcoat the word because folks might eat it, haven't they? Amen. So we, I mean, I'm not sugarcoating. I'm not pulling no punches. Psalm 128, verses 1 through 6. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who, wa who walks in his ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you'll be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, for thus shall the should, uh, behold, for thus shall a man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Father, I pray at this time I can decrease, you'll increase, Lord, that you will speak through me this morning, Lord. Hide me behind your cross, Lord. Father, let your spirit go out before me, preparing the hearts, preparing the minds for each person this morning. And Father, I just pray as always that you bind Satan, loose your spirit on this group of people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How is a real man defined today? You know, society has a standard for a real man. Society will tell us different things. You know, who has the, who has the biggest guns? You know, who's the most built up? You know, is Arnold Schwarzenegger a real man? Is Sylvester Stallone a real man? You know, I'm talking old school because I don't know none of these new guys that's out there. But, uh, you know, society has set that standard. Well, that's a real man. You know, if you make it on the cover of Maxim magazine, are you a real man? Society has all these standards, you know. Is it the guy with the fastest car? You know, we've seen the movies Fast and Furious in different movies. Is that guy, is he a real man? Is he, is he the real man? You know, is it... Uh, person that makes the most money, the one that makes the most money, is he a real man? Or maybe it's the one that's earned the most prestige, you know, he's climbed the social ladder, he's climbed the corporate ladder, whatever it might be. Is that a real man? You know, society might say that all them things are, are things that could make a real man, they, they, that you could classify as a real man, but what does God what are some of the traits God expects out of a real man? That's the question here. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what society thinks. We're not going to stand accountable as men to society. We're not going to stand accountable to, <clears throat> to the world out there. We're going to stand accountable to God as men. So what does the Bible say? What are some of the traits that we should have as men? Psalm 128 holds some of them traits. If you look in verse 1, it says... Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in a way. A real man will have a faithful walk. He'll have a faithful walk. This starts in the home. This starts in your home. What kind of example are you setting before your children and your, as a husband and a father? What kind of example are you setting before your children and your wife as a husband and a father? <clears throat> Men, we are to have a real walk with God. Not just a Sunday morning walk, not just a convenient walk, a real walk with God. It should be evident to your wife and your children. They should be the first ones that see it. They can doubt you in a lot of things. Your wife and your children can doubt you in a lot of things. They can doubt you in your abilities. I, I'm working on putting new, a new tub in our bathroom right now. And I am pretty sure that Cheryl has doubted me on my abilities on that. Because she knows I am not a carpenter. Yeah, she, she can doubt me. And women, you can doubt your men on a lot of things. You can doubt them on their abilities, maybe doubt them on, <clears throat> on your motives. You know, hey, men, we, we start loving our wives and, you know, trying to be sweet to them and all. And sometimes they'd be like, yeah, I know what you want. You, you don't know how to hear. Yeah, and maybe we're innocent. Maybe we don't really mean that. But hey, don't tell me I'm the only man here that goes through that now. You, you all know <clears throat> yeah, they can doubt our motives. Yeah, they can doubt. They can doubt maybe sickness. You know, sometimes 
Maybe you ain't quite as sick as you tend to be. You know, sometimes women talk about men, we kind of big babies when we get sick. Yeah, they, they can doubt all that. But one thing your woman and your children should not doubt is if he's trying to walk with God daily. They should never doubt that. They can doubt a lot of things, but they should never have to doubt is he trying to walk with God daily. Not just when it's convenient, not just when you want to. Are you trying to walk with God daily? What did Jesus teach us to call God? He taught us to call God our Father. If you're a child and you have a father, then what is your mind going to say? It's going to say God is like Daddy, right? <clears throat> We're taught to pray to God, our Father. In the home, the husband is a, is a representation to God, to his children, and the Lord Jesus Christ to his wife. I'm not saying you are God. I'm not saying you are the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saying you're representative of that in your home. The Bible says that God sent his spirit into our hearts to cry, Abba, Father. This means Daddy. This means Daddy, Father. 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 7. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and the God... And God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. But the man... Woman is the glory of man. He says the woman is the glory of man. That is, in the home, the man pictures Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's, he should be a, striving to be God like, a Christ like in his home. That should be his main, main thing. He should be striving to be more Christ like. Now, again, don't get me wrong. There ain't no man here, God. There ain't no man here, Christ. Don't go home saying, Well, the preacher told me I'm God in this house. No, I'm saying you ought to be more godly. You ought to be more Christ-like. That you ought to be setting a godly example. You ought to be setting a Christ-like example in your home. You're a representative of that. Don't ever get the idea. Let me back up a little bit. The woman, all right, so the man pictures, he's a picture of Christ. He's a picture of godliness in his home. The woman's a picture of the church, the bride of Christ, right? <clears throat> So the man has a responsibility to his woman just like Christ has a responsibility to the church. Listen to me, men. Don't you ever think that religion and spirituality is primarily for the women and the children. Because that has tended, that, that has become the norm a lot, especially down here in the South it seems like. That we leave the spirituality, we got better things, we got manly things to do. We leave the spirituality up to the women and the children. That's not the case. That is not the way God designed it. That's not the way it's meant to be. God demands more spirituality from the man than from the woman. He demands us to be more spiritual than he does the woman. God puts a bigger responsibility on the man than the woman. See, so this ain't this ain't got nothing to do with belittling a woman keeping a woman down, oppressing a woman, anything like this. Men, this is you stepping up to the plate and taking your responsibility. So we don't have men, like Nathan talked about a while ago, we have men that are godly, that are standing up, and they're doing like they should be doing. We have a problem in society today. Men do not accept the responsibility that God has given to them. We pass the buck on to our, to our ladies, to our wives. We don't accept the responsibility. There is a bigger responsibility Biblically on the man than on the woman. And if your home ain't right, you share the primary responsibility. Not her, not the children. Men, we are the head of the home. We have that responsibility. <clears throat> At the end of the age, when all believers were standing in line waiting to get into heaven, God appeared and said, I want all the men to form two lines. One line will be for the men who were, who were the true heads of their households. The other will be for the men who were dominated by their wives. 
God continued, I want all the women to report to St. Peter. The women left and the men formed two lines. The lines of the men who were dominated by their wives was seemingly unending. The line of men who were the true head of their households had one man in it. God said to the first line, you men ought to be ashamed of yourselves. I appointed you to be the heads of your households and you were disobedient and have not fulfilled your purpose. Of all of you, there is only one man who obeyed me. Learn from him. Then God turned to the long man and asked, How did you come to be in this line? The man replied, My wife told me to stand here. <laughs> Verse 2 of Psalm 128, When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy, and it will be well for you. A real man will have a fruitful walk. God's plan is for the man to be the provider of the family. If your wife can't say anything else nice about you, she ought to be able to say he's a good provider. He provides for our family. He sh she should be able to say that if she can't say anything else nice about you. She should be able to say that. But what, what do we see going on out here today? We see so many people that don't provide. We see so many men that sit around and do nothing. <clears throat> this mandate goes all the way back to Genesis. That curse that we see in Genesis, Genesis 3.19 by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Sorry, men, this is what you got to look forward to. You're going to work until you return to the dust. That's your mandate from God. That's the curse after the fall of man. That's part of that curse. We have to work. Not always easy, is it? You know, there's some, uh, Monday mornings are the worst. I don't want to get up and be an adult a lot of times. I don't want to take the responsibility. I would love to just lay home and do nothing. I don't play video games, so I can't do that, but I'm sure I can find something. I can afford to put gas in the Harley, I'll ride. <laughs> nothing else. <clears throat> but that's not the real world. You know, it's not always easy because we have responsibilities. You know, what's the consequences if we don't? Look at Proverbs 12, 11. He who tills his lamb will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless things lack sense. What are worthless things? Well, they can be a lot of things. Video games. I've seen guys, that's all they do, pursue video games. What's the worth in that? There is none. You know, um, maybe the easy way out, scams. You know, that person always looking to make the easy dollar. They're not willing to work, but they're trying to find some way to pull in an easy dollar. Worthless. Nothing in there for it. Just get out and work. That's what the Bible tells you to do. i seen that thing going on around Facebook. A while back, it showed a job application. It said, if you'll fill this out, <clears throat> you, and within two weeks, you will be blessed with financial security. Something along them lines. There's a lot of truth in that. Everybody's looking for a quick, easy way. They're looking for this quick blessing. God says, go to work. You want financial blessings? Go to work. Earn it. Get it. You know, fantasies, you know. Them can be worthless things. You know, sometimes we have to accept reality. You know, you might, we were taught growing up that you can be anything you want to be, you know. And that's a pretty, that's, that's a great thought. I mean, and there's some truth in that. But, you know, some people's got to be the ditch digger. Some people's got to be the scientist. You know, I, I could be, you know, I could say, well, I want to be a, one of them guys that rides a Kentucky Derby, Derby horse. I might be short enough for it, but I'm too fat for it. I can tell you that. The reality's not there. You know, sometimes we have to accept reality. We can't be everything, can't be that thing we, that fantasy we want to be, and go on and do what we have to do to provide. Here's one for all anybody that might think Jesus was a socialist. Psalm 1915, laziness cast into a deep sleep and an idle man will suffer hunger. He says, you don't work, you don't eat. Pretty much what he says. You don't work, you don't eat. Socialism says, you don't work, we'll take it from somebody else and give it to you. Jesus said, you don't work, you don't eat. That's what the Bible says there. God made man to work. He gave us a tougher exterior than women. You know, we have a tougher exterior than most women. <clears throat> This is nothing, again, this is nothing belittling to a woman. This is just the way God designed things. I'd rather have 
the Genesis curse of man than the Genesis curse of woman. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. And they can have that. They can have it. I'll go work. They can have that. I, I, they say one of the most, the closest thing a man will ever come to childbirth is having kidney stones. I've had quite a few kidney stones. I, I can testify to kidney stones. And one good thing about kidney stones, when I pass it, it's gone. Cheryl's had two kids. The last one was 11 years ago, and they're still here. Still here. <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather work. Verses 3 through 5. Your wife should be like a fruitful vine. Within your house, your children like all of the plants around your table. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion that you may see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. A real man will have a family that worships. A real man will have a family that worships. God's plan for the man, Joshua 24, 15. A lot of y'all familiar with this word, verse. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a bold statement in today's world. Lots of gods out there to choose from today. Lots of gods out there. You got the God of money. You got the God of material things. You got the God of sex. You got the gods of drugs. Lots of gods. The list just goes on and on and on and on. The gods you can choose from to serve out here in this world today. But what God, what the one true God wants you to do is to forsake all them other gods and to be as bold as Joshua. He wants you to step up. And he wants you to be a man. He wants you to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a bold statement today. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what? When you do this, you won't always be the most popular. Not even in your own house, you won't always be the most popular. Because this means bringing your family to church. This means being the one that says, oh, I don't care if feel like laying around today. We're going to church. It means leading them in prayer. Leading them in prayer. You know, I, I try to, I, I've instilled in my kids about praying over supper. You know, can't, can't eat before we pray. Now, every now and then, I shared this other night with a couple people. Every now and then, you know, I'll be hungry. And sure, that'll smell so good when I come in. And, you know, we'll, I'll have my plate ready waiting on Cheryl to come sit down or whatever, and I'll steal me a French fry or whatever it is off of there. And Sarah catch me, and she'll say, Daddy, did you just eat before you prayed? You're a preacher. What are you doing? <laughs> she'll call me out. You know. But we're, we're supposed to instill that in our children. We're supposed to instill a prayer life. You know, lead them in prayer. Let them know. Make sure they learn the Scripture. You know, explain Scriptures to them. Use some of life's circumstances to show them how things go. Um... Real men should have, we should have a genuine concern over our family's salvation. We should be really concerned about our family salvation. I've seen where, where Craig Franklin had posted something where he's baptizing his 11-year-old son today. He said, I've got one more to go. He has seen his children come to the Lord, and he's got a two-year-old. He's waiting for that time. He said it's part of what he promised to God. He promised to God he would be the man in his family. He would lead his children. He would make sure they knew about Jesus. He would teach them in the scriptures. He'd teach them to pray. And that they would come to salvation. Now, be careful here. I want to share with you a real quick little story of what happened one time. A young man, Ethan's age, several years ago, <clears throat> we were still at Unity. And, uh, we were picking this young man up and taking him to church with us. One afternoon, I picked him up. I got into a real good conversation with him, shared the plan of salvation. He accepted Christ. 
me and Carol Martin knelt down there with him at the altar at Unity Church and prayed with him. He accepted Christ right there. I brought him home that night, walked him inside, and I told his mother what happened. She said, well, that's really sweet, but he done that several years ago. You know, that's dangerous ground right there. To just ignore it. We should be genuinely concerned. You know, we, we shouldn't just take it for granted that they were saved. We should be genuinely concerned over our children's salvation. And the most important thing we can do is live it out in front of them. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? I can tell you, I'm far from perfect. Far from perfect. But I believe, I believe if you ask my kids, and does daddy love the Lord? Does daddy want to, does daddy try to be more Christ-like? I believe they'll tell you, yeah. Now they'll be quick to tell you daddy's not perfect. Daddy blows up. Daddy has a temper sometimes. Daddy gets mad, just like anybody else. But me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I made that promise a long time ago. My challenge for you today, man, my challenge for you here today, man, is will you make that proclamation? Will you make that? See, this message was intended for men, for the, the fathers here today. We got men here that's not fathers, that might be fathers one day. We've got women here that are single, that, that are going to be finding husbands one day. They need to know what to look for in a godly father for their children. So everybody can benefit from this. But my challenge to the fathers that are here today, will you make that proclamation? Will you cry out in boldness? Will you man up today and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? That's my challenge for you today. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As Daniel comes up and plays, if anybody needs to come to this altar, if you need to renew that with God, if you're like me and you slip on that a lot of times and you just need to be up here and, God, I need your strength, I need your help, I invite you up here today to come to these altars. If you just want to come up here and talk to God a little bit, come up here today. These altars are open. Come on up. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the first step. You can't be a godly man if you don't have the God of the God of this universe living inside of you. You can't do it on your own. You gotta have Jesus. You gotta have Him. If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, today's the day. That's the first step in any of it.